Namaste. We carry forward our discussion on community ecology and today we will have a look at succession. Now, succession asks the question how does a community form and how does a community change. So, ecological succession is one of the ways in which the community changes. So, it asks the question suppose you have a bare piece of rock. So, you have this rock that has come up because of say some volcanic activity. So, this would be primarily a basalt rock or for instance there is a granite rock that is deep inside the earth and because of some tectonic activities because of some earthquake related activities this rock comes up to the surface of the earth. Now, this rock does not have any soil associated with it, it is just a bare rock. So, how is it that this rock is converted into soil and then how do different kinds of communities or different kinds of populations come into this place and then form a community and then will that community remain constant with time or will that community go on changing with time. And if this community changes what are the factors that are responsible for these changes. So, all of these things are considered in the case of uh, succession. So, in this case we have this, uh, uh, this magma that is coming out and here we have the rocks that have been formed. Now, these rocks are very hard rocks. So, essentially if you put any plant here, the plant will not be able to grow. Even if you say make a hole somewhere here and put a plant inside, the plant will not be able to grow because it does not have access to water, it does not have access to the minerals. Now, this rock is all full of minerals, it has all the nutrients that a plant might need. But then all of those nutrients are locked inside the various minerals that are formed uh, that are that are there in this rock. So, all these nutrients have to be released by some process and that process is the ecological succession. So, once you have these rocks in a short time you will find that there are some lichens that are coming up onto these rocks. Now, lichens are extremely hardy species. So, here on the background this grey color is the rock and these yellow colored things are the lichens. Now, these are very simple organisms, these are very primitive organisms and they do not uh, have a huge nutrient requirement. So, essentially they can make use of those small little minerals that are present on the surface of this rock or maybe those nutrients that are brought uh, along with the wind when it blows some dust on this these rocks. So, any small amount of nutrients, any small amount of minerals that are available, these lichens can make use of that. Plus, these lichens are photosynthetic organisms, these are photoautotrophs. So, they can make use of the sunlight to produce their own food. At the same time, their requirements for water is also very less. So, any amount of rainfall that comes into this area, the lichens will uh, absorb that water and maybe store it into their bodies or maybe if this area is close to the oceans and the air has a lot of humidity. So, these lichens can even make use of that humidity. So, what are these lichens doing here? Th these lichens once they have come up on the surface of these rocks, they will use the nutrients that are there on the surface or the nutrients that are brought along with the dust particles, they will make use of the water they will make use of sunlight and they will start to proliferate in this area. And at this particular stage there is no competition, there is nothing other than lichens. So, the lichens can have all the space for themselves. So, they are able to cover the whole of the surface. Now, when you have any organic substance that is growing up in any area and when this substance starts to degrade, you will have a number of organic acids that are formed. So, when you have these lichens and when these lichens die out or probably even while they are living, they will be creating a number of organic acids and some of them will be released into the rocks. So, that is a very small amount of uh, acids that is being released, but nonetheless it plays a very important role. Because once you have these mineral acids, once you have the action of chemicals on these rocks, there is 
some more amount of fragmentation. So, probably earlier you only had the surface of the rock that was available for the growth of these lichens. Now, because they have released some acids, then probably a very thin shell of these rocks has now started to disintegrate. Now, once this shell starts to disintegrate, what is happening is that you have much more amount of minerals that are now available for the growth of any plant material. Because earlier you only had the dust that was there, you only had access to those minerals that were exactly on the surface. But now that you have this thin shell that has started deteriorating, so more and more minerals will start breaking apart, more and more nutrients will be released and so now some more plants can come into the place. And what are those plants? The next stage is the folios lichen. Now, earlier we had the crustose lichen. Now, in the case of this crustose lichen, you can see that these are in the form of a crust that has come up on the surface. They look like a crust or uh, uh, so that is why they are called as crustose lichen. In the case of folios lichen, these look more like leaves. So, if you look at these portions carefully, it looks like you have some so some leaf kind of arrangement in this place. Now, crustose lichen are followed by the folios lichen. The requirements of folios lichen are a bit more than that of the crustose lichen. So, the, the folios lichen cannot come up as the first organism or as the pioneer species. But once you have uh, these rocks that have been uh, broken apart, especially on their top surface. So, now because you have more amount of nutrients that are available. So, there is more nutrients plus there is more amount of strata that is available for any uh, autotrophic organism to make a small indentation or make, make a small attachment to the rock. So, once that happens and when you have these folios lichen. Now, the properties of folios lichen are that they have a slightly larger nutrient requirement, they have a slightly more three dimensional structure. So, they are coming out of the surface plus they are able to perform photosynthesis in a much more efficient manner than the crustose lichen. Now, in the case of the crustose lichen, their photosynthetic efficiency was less and in the case of the folios lichen, their photosynthetic efficiency is more. Now, once you have both these kinds of organisms in this area, what do you think? Who is going to outcompete whom? Now, of course, the folios lichen who have a better photosynthetic ability, they will be able to outcompete the crustose lichen. So, the crustose lichen made way for the folios lichen and the folios lichen in uh, effect were able to displace out the crustose lichen from this area. Now, where are we getting all these lichens from? These lichens are coming from the spores that are there in the air or are, or are being brought about from the winds. So, they were not present initially when we had these rocks, you do not have any plant material, but then along with the air, you will have some spores that will come and land here, you will have some amount of dust that will come and land here. And then probably in the next rains, you will have this process of succession that has started from the crustose lichen into the folios lichen. Now, when you have these folios lichen, they are able to generate much more amount of organic material as compared to the crustose lichen and in effect they are able to generate much more amount of acids when they are living and also when their bodies are decaying. Now, in that case, you will have that the layer of uh, of rocks that was exposed, it now deepens a bit. So, in place of having a very small shell, now you have a slightly long larger shell and in this case as well, you do not actually have soil here, but then because these rocks have now, now broken up on their shell. So, you have uh, a scope for something larger to come up. Now, from the folios like in stage, the next stage is the moss stage. Now, the moss stage will come up when you have these rocks whose surface has been broken up to a larger extent. So, they cannot come before the folios lichen or before the crustose lichen, uh, 
they will come only after that and once they have come up, so now you can see that these are all more greenish in color, so they have much more better photosynthetic ability and then because of the inter specific competition, they will be able to displace off the folios lichen that are present there. Now, of course, it is not necessary that all of these areas should have a complete cover of uh, mosses. So, it is possible that in this particular rock, you have this area, the first area that has say mosses, you have some other area that still has your crustose lichen, you can have some other area that has your folios lichen and so on. Because in this particular region, uh, your succession is started much before then it was able to do in this area or probably in this area where you only have a bare rock. So, in a large chunk of rock, it is possible that you have different stages in different places, but then after a while this is the, uh, the way in which your community will move from one organism to the next organism. Now, in the case of these mosses, they are doing much more photosynthesis, they have some roots that are now coming up and once you have the roots, they will able to break up the rocks even further. Why? Because if this is your rock and then you have this crack which was there and the top surface is having some amount of broken portions in which you can um, have the nutrients. Now, if you have a plant that is coming up in this area, so this plant will be having roots and probably the roots will reach much deeper. So, in this case your roots are able to reach this point and are probably able to secrete some chemicals inside this crack. So, probably some acids because the roots also want to make space for themselves. So, in that case you will have some more amount of degradation that is happening very deep inside and once that happens then probably this crack will enlarge and similarly if you say have a very small crack here and you have a root that is coming up here. So, this crack will also start to enlarge. So, in effect what is happening is that this rock surface is now getting more and more cracked and in these cracks there would be other processes as well. So, for instance, if you have a rock and you say have this crack here. Now, in the night time prob uh, probably there would be some amount of dew that would accumulate. So, dew consists of your water droplets, probably some amount of water droplets will start accumulating inside. And once that happens and if the temperature is very less, so in that case these uh, water droplets might start to freeze. So, they will form a piece of ice inside. Now, we know that the density of water is highest at 4 degrees Celsius. So, as, as your temperature is going down, as it reaches 4 degrees, so you have the densest amount of uh, the, the, the densest sort of water. Then once the, start, uh, the ice starts forming, so you have reduced its temperature from 4 to 3 to 2 to 1 and then 0 and maybe even to the sub 0 temperatures. So, what is happening now is that the, the density of water is now reducing which is why which means that the uh, that the water is now becoming lighter which is why you have ice cubes that float on the surface of water because they have a lesser density. Now, if something has a lesser density it means that it has a larger volume and once you have something that has a larger volume it requires more amount of space. So, when these ice particles when they start freezing in this area they also exert some kind of outward force on this particular crack and on this particular rock. So, what would that lead to? That would lead to some secondary cracks that develop on the surface and once that happens, you will have water that comes into these areas as well. Then later on when it forms an ice here, so you will have larger quantities of ice that are being formed and then they again start, uh, start exerting the forces on the surface of these cracks and ultimately this crack 
starts to expand in size you will have more and more number of cracks on the surface of this rock. And this process is also accentuated by the presence of the plant species because they are also living there they are also uh, secreting out some acids which is which are further weakening the rocks and so on. Now, not just ice, but you can also have a situation in which you have a surface of the rock and when you have the sun that is shining in the daytime. So, probably this area becomes very warm and then in the night time when the area cools down. So, this area is now suffering it is now becoming cold and so it is now shrinking. Now, for um, for a number of materials when you heat up the material the size increases when you cool it down the size reduces. Now, in this case because of the continuous action of sun and the moon you will have some expansion and some contraction that is happening on the surface at all times. Once that happens that will also lead to the breaking up of the rock surface. And in the case of uh, rocks such as granite, this is known by the term of onion withering. Because just like if you take a piece of onion, you will have a number of uh, leaves that are one. So, so, similarly in this case, you will have a rock that will look something like this. So, you, after a while you will have see a small section that has come out here, a small section that has come out here a small leaf that has come out here and so on. So, in this case your rock is now getting separated layer by layer. So, just like in the case of an onion you have layers that are forming on the surface which are also leading to cracks here. Similarly, if you have a, a rock with a small crack and probably this area is close to the seas. Now, if, if this area is close to the seas then you might have some amount of sea water that is coming into that this area or probably some amount of salts that are being blown along with the wind and are getting deposited here. Now, what happens? If you have say a small amount of salty water brackish water here and when uh, you have the sun. So, this water starts to evaporate once that starts to evaporate the, the salt particles they start accumulating here then later on maybe some more amount of water came along with the salts. So, you again that evaporated. So, after a while you will have a salt solution that is of a very high concentration and in this high concentration when you again have the sun. So, you will start seeing crystals of salt that are forming here. Now, again once you have this crystal formation the, the salt crystal that was earlier say small in size that will start becoming larger and larger in size. Now, during this process of crystallization as your crystal is expanding there also it will start exerting forces on these surfaces and because of these forces the rock might crack further. So, when we are talking about succession it is not just the biotic organisms or the or the different populations that are playing a role, but at the same time the climatic conditions or the prevalent conditions are also playing a role in this case. Now, once you have these cracks you started with the lichens now you have reached the moss stage. Now, the moss will further accentuate the cracks and after a short while when these mosses start to die their bodies will start converting into the humus. So, now you have an area where you have this rock, this rock is cracked in a number of places, then this rock has also been converted into a powdery form at a number of places. Now, these rocks also have some lichens and maybe some mosses that have come up and they are also dying, when, when they are dying you are also having some organic material that is coming up into this area. So, what do you have now? You have rock particles. which is providing you minerals, you have the organic matter which is coming from the dead tissues of these different uh, species 
once you combine both of these together what is this this is soil so now you have soil in this area so because of the action of the climate because of the action of different plants now this rock has uh, this uh, this top layer of the rock has now been converted into soil now once you have soil in an area you will start seeing some other species maybe you will start seeing grasses in that area now grasses are much more uh, prolific species they are able to perform photosynthesis in a much better way and once you start seeing grasses in this area so the mosses and the lichens they have now been out competed so they are they get removed from the system and now you have lots and lots of grasses once you have these grasses they are now further breaking up the soil or they are further breaking up the rock surface that is down there because of they have uh, because they have a very extensive root system so in the case of your mosses you did not have an extensive root system but now you even have a more extensive root system you have a much better photosynthetic ability so you are able to generate a much larger amount of organic matter so in this process the rocks are now uh, breaking up even further and after a short while these grasses will make way for shrubs now as we are moving from the grasses to the shrubs we will observe that the requirement of different nutrients will change again because grasses can grow in low nutrient environments but your shrubs will require typically a higher nutrient uh, conditions now these high nutrient conditions are brought about because the grasses were able to break the rocks break the soil and so much more amount of nutrients now becomes available for the growth of these plants and after the shrubs you will start seeing a forest in a short while now a forest is typically referred to as a climax community so this is typically the end where your succession is going to end so you start from a bare rock you move from lichens to mosses to grass to shrubs to trees and ultimately you reach to a climax stage which is the forest stage now this is what succession is all about so when you talk about succession you are asking which species is making way for which species so who comes after whom that is what you are asking when you are studying succession so for instance even in the case of uh, royalty when we say that there is this particular prince who is going to succeed his father as the next king so that is succession here in the case of ecological succession we are asking which community is uh, getting succeeded and which community is succeeding the previous community now we define ecological succession as the process of change in the species structure of an ecological community over time now we have this ecological community which was having your uh, lichens in an area maybe it was having say two or three different species of lichen but then slowly and steadily the species structure is changing you are getting other species such as grasses you are getting shrubs the earlier species are getting out competed they are dying off they are making way for these newer species and so the species structure of the of the ecological community is changing at all times and the process of this change is known as ecological succession it takes place over a long period of time and we also have this other term which is called a seer seer or a serial community is an intermediate stage found in ecological succession in ecosystem advancing towards its climax community so essentially when we were referring to a community that ultimately became a forest so this community started with your lichens which was both crustose and then followed by your lichens that have folios structure so crustose lichen followed by folios lichen followed by your mosses followed by grass followed by shrubs and followed by the forest so all of these different communities so if you are talking about a community that is all full of lichens that is called a serial stage in this succession if you talk about a community that has grass 
that is a serial stage in this succession. So, a serial com community is in intermediate stage, it is not the final stage, but it is the intermediate stage that is found in ecological succession in an ecosystem advancing towards its climax community. Now, in this case, the forest is the climax community. Now, when we talk about seers, they are of three different kinds. The first one is known as a hydro seer. Now, hydro is water, seer is your serial community. So, this is a serial community that is found in water and we will have a look at it in more detail in a short while. The second one is a zero seer. Now, zero is dry, so dry community, a community in a dry area. This includes a litho seer. So, a litho seer is a community on a rock as we just saw and it could also be a samosir. Now, samosir is you have sand in community. So, it is a community on sand. So, if you look at uh, ecological successions that are happening on, on sand dunes, that is an example of samosir. The third kind is a halosir. Now, halo is salt, seer is a community. So, you have a community in salt or a, or a community in a saline body such as a marsh. Now, when we talk about this succession, this succession proceeds from a pioneer species towards a climatic climax species. Now, in this case, we had started with rocks and rocks made the first community that came up was this crustose lichen. Now, this would be called as a pioneer species pioneer because this is the first one to come up. So, it is a pioneer. So, pioneer is the first one, climax is the last one and everything in between is a seer or a serial community. Now, pioneer species are defined as they are hardy species which establish themselves in a disrupted ecosystem and trigger the process of ecological succession. Now, they may, may come up in an area where you did not have any uh, community beforehand or they may come up in a disrupted ecosystem. Now, what do we mean by a disrupted ecosystem? So, probably you have a forest and in this forest you have a number of trees, probably you have some shrubs, you have some herbs and so on and then you have a forest fire because of which all of these die out. So, now you have a community in which you have disrupted something. So, probably a few trees remain in this area, but then everything else has been disrupted. Now, what would come up in these areas? So, the first species to come up in this area will again be called a pioneer species, because it is the first one to come up in this disrupted ecosystem. So, pioneer species are hardy species which establish themselves in a disrupted ecosystem and trigger the process of ecological succession. So, if you do not have a pioneer species, you will not have the ecological succession because there is no other species that can replace this pioneer species. Now, why is that so? Because of their specific characteristics. The characteristics are their ability to grow on bare rocks, nutrient poor soil or water. So, they are the first one to come up and they can come up on bare rocks where you do not have any soil or they can come up in a soil that is nutrient poor or they can even come up in a soil that is or they can even come up in water that is also nutrient poor. Now, what are the examples of these soils that are nutrient poor? So, uh, consider a glacier. Now, a glacier when it is moving from one place to another, it is also uh, grinding the rocks that are below the glacier and once this glacier melts, the rocks uh, that have been ground up they come up in the form of a soil and that soil is extremely nutrient poor. It does not have any organic materials, it does not have a number of minerals because uh, it has never been acted upon organically. So, the organisms that can come up in such a soil that will also be the pioneer species. The other characteristics are the ability to tolerate extreme conditions such as heat and cold. Now, when we are talking about a community that is coming up on a piece of rock. So, in the daytime it is getting exposed to very hot conditions, in the night time it is getting exposed to very cold conditions. 
Now, if we have a community that is coming up in a forest. So, in this forest you have much more moderate climatic conditions, because all the all the time you are having a high moisture level. If you look at a location say here or a location say here. So, you have a high moisture content, you are not exposed to the direct rays of the sun, because the plants are cutting it out. And then you are also not exposed to a very cold condition, because the air movement that would have happened in this area is also being stopped because of the trees. But in the case of a bare rock, you will be exposed to all the conditions. Now, the pioneer species are able to tolerate these extreme conditions, they are able to tolerate extreme heat, they are able to tolerate extreme cold. They have less nutritional requirements and they are often photo autotrophs, because they are photo autotrophs, because there is nothing else available for them. So, only those species can come up and they have less nutritional requirements. If there is a species that requires say nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium in high concentration may be in a water soluble form that is available in soil that cannot be a pioneer species. They are typically small in size, because again you have less amount of nutrients that are available, you have very extreme conditions and so you are not able to uh, or these species are not able to support a very uh, large body size. So, they are small in size, they often have a short life span with rapid growth and they are mostly annual species. So, they are not perennial species, they cannot uh, remain there for a number of years, they probably uh, come up in those conditions that are favorable and then they die off. So, probably in the very extreme summers they will die off, probably in very extreme winters you would not see these species, probably these species will come up in the spring season in that area. Now, because you have spring season only once in a year, so these species will come up only once in a year and then they will die off. So, they often have a short life span as against our forest species or the climatic or the climax species that have a very long life span. Then they have the ability to disperse through spores or seeds and they are also prolific seed producers. Now, they are they have to be those species that are able to disperse through spores or seeds, because otherwise when you talk about a bare piece of rock say of a volcanic origin, where do you get these spores in the first place or where do you get these pioneer species in the first place. So, they have to have a, a dispersal mechanism through either air or through water. So, they have to give out spores or seeds and typically these plants are also very prolific in their seed production. On the other hand we have the climax species. So, in our example the forest was the climax species. Now, a climax species is defined as or a climax community is defined as a biological community of plants, animals and fungi, which through the process of ecological succession in the development of vegetation in an area over time have reached a steady state. So, essentially when we talk about a climax community, it is a steady state community. When we say a steady state, it means that it is able to remain as this community for a very long period of time. So, once you have these sal forests in this area, so probably they will continue for hundreds of years, because they are in a steady state, there is no other factor that is now pushing them towards some other community or towards some other change. So, it is a biological community of plants, animals and fungi. Now, why does it have all these together? Unlike a pioneer species that is making way for itself, in the case of a climax uh, community you have so many species that are together that they are able to support each other. So, when you have the plants that are growing, so these plants will be uh, uh, will be giving out leaves, these leaves upon dying they will fall onto the ground and if you do not have fungi, then you will not be able to break these leaves down into the nutrients again. Or if, if you do not have say these animals here, so in that case probably there would be some species that would try to out compete everything else. Now, because you have these predatory organisms, because you have these animals and because you have a rich biodiversity with a lot uh, with a number of uh, uh, decomposers. So, this community is able to sustain itself for a very long period of time, so that it has reached a steady state. Now, there are four kinds of climaxes that have been recognized. The first one is a climatic climax which is controlled by the 
climate of the region. So, for instance, when we talk about uh, a sal forest that is a climatic climax. So, it will come up in an area that has sufficient amount of moisture that is probably a cooler area. So, that is the species that will come up and uh, that will come up and the community that gets formed because of these uh, sal trees, the forest that would be a climatic climax because it has been determined because of the climate and it continues to remain there for a very long period of time. The second one is an edaphic climax. So, that is controlled by the soil conditions of the region. So, different kinds of soils will be having different kinds of climax species or climax communities. So, that is uh, when you have a condition like that it is known as an edaphic climax. The third one is a catastrophic climax that is controlled by some catastrophic event such as wildfire. So, a good example would be your teak forest. Now, in a teak forest you have uh, these deciduous uh, trees in the form of tectona grandis and these trees shed their leaves. When you shed uh, when these trees shed their leaves you have ample amount of dry fuel that is available there and so they are very frequently prone to forest fires. Now, once you have the forest fires in these areas, so a number of other species that are now trying to push it towards some other cereal stage will die off. So, in this case what we are saying is that you have these forests, you have these teak trees and probably you are having some other trees that are now coming up. Now, these teak trees when they shed their leaves, so you have a lot amount of fuel that is available on the forest floor and when you have a very high uh, fuel load. So, typically these forests get engulfed in a large sized fire or these are rapidly or these are frequently exposed to forest fires. Now, once you have these forest fires, then the species that are not able to resist these fires they die off. So, these species die off, but then the teak plants because they are fire resistant, so they are able to survive. Now, if we do not have forest fires in these areas, then probably these teak forests will start converting into something else. So, they will start converting into a forest that is probably having more amount of moisture in that area, but then because we are having these forest fires every year or year after year. So, in that case they are able to maintain themselves as a teak forest or a, as a teak community. So, in this case the climax that has been formed is formed because of this catastrophic event and so it is known as a catastrophic climax. And the fourth one is a disc climax that is controlled by some disturbance which could be man or domestic animals and a good example is grasslands. So, in a grassland, so suppose you have these grasslands and these grasslands are being used for say cattle grazing. Now, when that is the situation, if there is any shrub that is coming up in this area, the man would come and it would kill off these. So, these would be uprooted. So, because of the action of human beings, these climax, uh, these communities are not able to evolve further. So, they are not able to convert into a shrubland or maybe into a woodland or into a forest. So, such kinds of communities that are governed or that have reached their climax stage because of some disturbance either due to man or due to domestic animals. So, these kinds of climax communities are known as disclimax communities. Now, whatever the kinds of uh, climax that we see, the climax community will have certain characteristics. What are those characteristics? The vegetation is tolerant of the environmental conditions. So, for instance, when we talk about a sal forest, you would not get a sal forest that is there in a marshy area, because it is un intolerant of the environmental condition. It will only be formed in those areas where the environmental conditions are suitable. So, the vegetation that comes up in a climax community, it is tolerant of the environmental conditions. The climax community typically has a high species diversity. <coughs> it has a well formed special structure. When we say a special structure, it means that we have a good top canopy, middle canopy, uh, say low uh, uh, your shrubs, 
your ground cover and so on. So, it has a well formed spatial structure. There are complex food chains that provide stability to this community. So, if you have a very simple uh, ecosystem, so that cannot be a climax ecosystem, you will typically have a very complicated structure, you will have a number of food chains, you will have a very complex food web. So, that even if there is some amount of disturbance, probably one particular species dies off or it gets reduced in its numbers. So, in that case there should be some other species that is able to support the community. So, in that case you will have very complex food chains that will provide stability, because remember that in the case of a climax community you want to have a situation that it is a steady state, it should persist, it should prevail for a very long period of time. So, for that you require stability which is provided by complex food chains and food webs. Then there is equilibrium between gross production and respiration, uptake and release of nutrients. When we mean, what do we mean by this equilibrium? If there is more uptake of nutrients and less release of nutrients. So, in that case your community will suffer some sort of a change, because you will have a soil that is getting depleted year after year. So, in that case the organisms that are living or the vegetation that has come up it might change, there might be some other species that would outcompete the present species, because the, the present species require much more amount of nutrients, they are taking up much more amount of nutrients, but then the soil is getting poorer and poorer with time. So, that cannot be a situation, because if that be the situation, then your community will change with time and a climax community cannot change. Or suppose you have a situation in which the uptake of nutrients is less, the release of nutrients is more. So, in that case your soil is changing, the soil is becoming more and more fertile with time. If that is the situation, so in that case you will have some other plants that are better able to use these nutrients and they will come up and they will start out competing the present species. So, there again you will have a situation that is not a climax situation, but is an intermediate situation. Similarly, you have equilibrium between gross production and respiration. So, on an average the amount of energy that is coming into the system is also getting lost because of respiration, because of uh, having a number of animals in this area. Suppose you have a gross production that is greater than respiration. So, in that case you will start accumulating more and more biomass in the system and once that happens, because it is changing with time, we will say that it is not a climax community. So, a climax community needs to have an equilibrium between a number of things such as gross production and respiration and uptake and release of nutrients. Also the species composition continues for a long time, again because it maintains a, a steady state, so the species uh, composition is not going to change. The climax community is a good indicator of the climate and other conditions of the area. Now, because you have these climax communities that are tolerant of the environmental conditions. So, if you have a climax community that has come up, you can just use the species that are found in the climax community to get an idea about the general climate and other conditions of the area. What is the soil type, how much amount of moisture do you have, what is the climate of that area, you can all you can tell about all of these just by looking at the climax community, because that is dependent on the environmental conditions and that is going to continue for a long period of time. Now, we have talked about succession, now let us look at the kinds of succession. There are three different kinds of succession, the first one is called is a primary succession. Successional dynamics beginning with colonization of an area that has not been previously occupied by an, an ecological community such as newly exposed rock or sand surfaces, lava flows, newly exposed glacial tilts, etcetera are referred to as primary succession. Now, in the case of a primary succession, it begins with an area that never had an ecological community beforehand, such as the bare rock situation that we just saw. The second one is a secondary succession. A secondary succession is successional dynamics following severe disturbance or removal of a pre-existing community are called secondary succession. A good example is a forest that suffered with a forest fire and in that forest fire all the plants died off and so you have an area that is now devoid of any vegetation. 
Now, when succession starts again in that area, that is known as a secondary succession. The third one is cyclic succession, which is periodic changes arising from fluctuating species interactions or recurring events. A cyclic succession, a good example is uh, that of the Brahmaputra flood plains. So, every year you get floods in that area. So, the species that are already there, they get uh, they die off because they get drowned and then every year you have a succession that it starts ab initio. So, every year you get a grassland and then uh, after a while you will get a flood again. So, all the species will die off and then again you will have the grasses that are coming up in this area. So, that is a cyclic succession. So, primary succession is succession in an area which never had any community. A secondary succession is an area which had a community, but everybody is died off and a cyclic succession is a succession that occurs in an area with some recurring events. Now, let us look at some examples of primary succession. Now, the first one is lithosphere that we have already seen. So, from rock you move to crustose lichen, to folios lichen, to moss, to herbaceous stage where you have the grasses, to shrub stage, to woodland stage and finally, to the climax stage. So, that is a lithosphere which is rock community. The second one is a hydrosphere which is a water community. Now, you have this water community and you have a primary succession. So, you have a body of water that has newly come up. So, probably there is an area that just got filled up with water. So, what will happen? From the water stage you will move to the phytoplankton stage because the phytoplankton will be the first community that will come up. So, these are the pioneer species. From the phytoplankton will move to a submerged state. Now, in the case of a submerged state, you will have some plants that are coming up and they are submerged. So, probably this is your water body and the first thing that will come up will be the plankton that will come on the very top, because that is the photosynthetic zone. Now, once these plant plankton have started dying uh, with time, so you will have these bodies that are now coming down. And once that happens, you have some amount of soil that has that has started accumulating in the bottom. Now, once you have these soils which are formed because of these organic materials that came from these planktons, so now you will start seeing some submerged ve vegetation. So, you will start seeing some plants that are coming up which are submerged. After this summer state, you will start seeing some floating vegetation. A floating vegetation is something that is coming up, it has these roots here and it is getting all the nutrients just from the water itself, it is not getting into contact with the soil. Now, from the floating stage, the next will be the reed swamp stage. So, now in the reed swamp stage, it will be coming up in the marshy areas. So, typically what is happening is that all these plants that are now forming, they will also start dying off with time and so the bottom layer is now increasing with time, because you now have much more amount of accumulation, much more amount of organic material that has come up. So, now this area has started converting into a marshy area. Once it converts into a marshy area, you will have the reed stage. The reed will be followed by a meadow stage, sedge and meadows that will come up. After the meadows, so meadows are very much like uh, tall plants that are living in that area and that this is equivalent to a shrub stage that we see in the lithosphere. Now, after this sage and meadow stage, you will again have quite a lot of water that is being taken out because of transpiration, quite a lot of organic matter that is getting deposited because now you have large sized plants. So, more and more amount of soil is getting formed, more and more amount of humus is getting formed. So, from the sage and meadow stage, you will move to the woodland stage where you start getting some trees in this area. So, typically with time, your organic matter is increasing in this area. So, once you have much more amount of organic matter, you will have a situation where this much area is now or all filled with the organic material and you have a very slight amount of water that is there on the top. So, here you will start seeing large size plants. Now, from these large size plants, they will be using up more and more amount of water and after a while, you will start seeing trees in this area and from the trees, you will move to the climax community, which is determined by the 
existing prevailing conditions in that area, what is the climate in this area, what is the availability of water in this area, what is the soil that is coming up in this area and so on. Now, that is the primary succession. What about the secondary succession? A secondary succession is something like you have a forest, you have a forest fire. So, you have a forest that is com incompletely destroyed. From there, you have the herbaceous stage because you already have quite a lot of soil in this area. So, you would not start with the lichens and the mosses, you will directly start with the grasses. So, you will have the grasses that come up followed by the shrubs, followed by the woodland, followed by the climax. And typically, we will observe that a secondary succession is much faster than a primary succession, because you already have soil in this area. So, even if the forests were burnt because of the forest fire, you but you still have the soil that remains in this area. So, you have an, a soil that is already formed, you do not have to start with a rock and start with breaking of the rocks. So, it is much faster. You already have spores and seeds that are present in the soil. So, there would be some seeds that are left unburnt and they will start the process of succession. As against in the case of a primary succession, where your spores had to be brought by the action of wind or water. Also, there can be regeneration of some plants from the roots. So, because you have these roots that are there inside the soil and the top layer got burnt, but the roots remain. So, probably there would be some amount of vegetative growth from the roots itself. So, that will also start and typically the soil fertility is high enough to support the organisms. So, in the case of a primary succession such as a rock, the fertility was less, but in this case the fertility is already high, because it was already supporting a large sized forest community. Now, succession is also classified as autogenic succession or allogenic succession. Now, auto is self gen is pro production. So, autogenic is something that uh, produces itself, allo is outside, genic is production. So, it is production from outside. Now, autogenic succession is a succession that is governed by something that is inside. It is brought by changes in the soil caused by the organisms that are already present there. These changes include accumulation of organic matter in litter or humic layer, alteration of soil nutrients or change in the pH of the soil due to, due to the plants growing there. Now, in the case of an autogenic succession, you have the organisms that are already present. Now, because you have these organisms, they are bringing about some changes in the biotic and the abiotic components of that ecosystem. So, for instance, you had this rock and this rock had some uh, lichens. So, because these lichens were able to break down the rocks further. So, they were making way for newer species such as the mosses, that is an autogenic succession. Allogenic succession is caused by external environmental influences and not by the vegetation. So, for example, soil changes due to erosion, leaching or deposition of silt and clay can alter the nutrient content and water relationships in the ecosystem. Other examples include volcanic eruptions, meteor or comet strike, flooding, drought, earthquakes and non-anthropogenic climate change. So, what we are seeing here is that in the case of an autogenic succession, you have a plant or a community that is already there and this community is making some changes that is leading to the succession. In the case of an allogenic succession, there is no role of the community that is already present, but we bring about a much greater influence from outside that is leading to a succession. So, a good example is something that we saw in the case of Brahmaputra. So, the Brahmaputra river floods every year. So, because of this flood, you have a succession that starts. It is not caused by the grasses that are already present in that area. But in the case of an autogenic succession, the succession will be caused because of the organisms that are already present. Now, we can differentiate between different phases of succession. So, this is typically what uh, you can correlate to the uh, rock example that we have seen. So, this, the succession begins with the nudation stage. So, nudation is making something bare. So, it begins with the development of a bare site such as a, uh, a rock surface or maybe a new lake that is formed. So, that does not have anything else, it is completely bare. So, that is nudation. After nudation, you will have 
migration which refers to the arrival of the propagules. So, in the case of your rocks you have the spores of uh, lichens that are coming up from outside so that is migration in, the, in this terminology. Now, remember that we had defined migration as a, as a seasonal movement of uh, organisms from one place to another in typically in a repetitive manner, but in this case when we talk about succession migration is just defined as the arrival of propagule. So, this is not the usual definition of migration. So, once you have the migration then you have ecchesis. Now, ecchesis is establishment and initial growth of vegetation. So, you had these lichens that established themselves and then they started growing in that area. Next you have aggregation which is increase in numbers and population densities. So, earlier you had a small patch of lichens, now you have a larger patch of lichens and there are a number of lichen individuals that are there in this population. Now, once you have aggregation the next stage will be competition. So, the vegetation has become well established, it grows and spreads. So, now uh, various organisms or various species now begin to compete for space, light and nutrients. So, when you had this lichen stage probably there were a few uh, moss spores that also migrated into this area, but now you have a competition and in this competition now you are pitting up the lichens against the mosses. Once that happens there would be some species that will be out competed and some species that will be able to keep themselves uh, fixed in that area. Now, after competition we have the reaction phase. During this phase the autogenic changes such as build up of humus affect the habitat and one plant community replaces another. Now, you have competition between lichens and mosses, but then the lichens have already changed the soil in that area. So, they have made the soil much more fertile and so when the when there is a fertile soil that is available so the mosses are able to out compete the lichens so the lichens made way for the mosses and the uh, and one plant community has now replaced another so that is the reaction phase and these phases will continue because after you have a moss community you will uh, start again with this phase you will have migration of grass seeds and then there will be ecchesis so you have these uh, mosses that are now establishing themselves, they are increasing in their numbers, there is competition, but then there has also been migration of some grass seeds. So, in that case you will again have a reaction, in the case of reaction the mosses will make way for the grasses, the mosses will die out, grasses will establish themselves and then again you move with the establishment, aggregation, competition and reaction. Now, in the next stage the reaction will be with the shrub seeds that have migrated into this area and this process continues again and again until you reach a phase of stabilization in which you have reached a climax community. So, now there is no more change that is possible whatever is there is the most optimum stage. So, these are the phases of struggle of succession and when we talk about these climaxes then one question arises how many climaxes can be there. So, suppose I have a bare piece of rock in the case of Madhya Pradesh. So, in this rock what would be the climaxes? Uh, uh, community that will come up. So, in this case there have been a number of observations. So, the first one is by Clements in 1916 he put up a theory which is known as a monoclimax theory or a climatic climax theory. There is only one climax whose characteristics are determined solely by the climate. The process of succession and modification of environment uh, overcome the effects of other factors such as topography, parent material of the soil etcetera. So, basically if we go with this theory it would say that because we have this rock in Madhya Pradesh. So, this rock is governed or the, the climax community that will come up in this area will be governed only by the climate of this area. So, essentially whatever is the, the climax community in the nearby area that would be the climax community that will come up on this rock. So, this is mono uh, monoclimax theory that is one climax only. So, uh, in any particular area you can uh, determine ab initio what is going to be the climax community in that area. The second theory is that of uh, Tansley which is called as the polyclimax theory. Now, polyclimax theory says that the climax vegetation of an of a region consists of more than one vegetation climaxes 
that are controlled by soil moisture, soil nutrients, topography, soil exposure, fire and animal activity. So, in the case of Clements, he said that there will be only one climax that will come up in this area. In the case of Tansley, he said that there could be some other climaxes that could also come up. So, probably this rock is closer to a water body. So, in that case, the climax will be different as compared to when this rock is say uh, closer to another or maybe it is closer to the mountains. So, depending on the situations that are nearby, you will have the climax that comes up. And the third one is a climax pattern theory, which was given by Whitaker, and he said that there is a variety of climaxes governed by responses of species populations to biotic and abiotic conditions. The nature of climax vegetation will change as the environment changes, with the central and most widespread community being the climatic climax. So, in this case, he said that you will not have one particular climax, but then even this climax community will go on changing a bit it will go on changing bit by bit, but the most widespread community will be the climatic climax, but then what comes up actually in this area you cannot determine it on the basis of just of on the basis of the climatic conditions or on the basis of the ambient conditions, but then it will go on changing with time. So, it will be near to the climatic climax, but then the actual climax that comes up will be a bit different. So, in this lecture, we looked at succession, different kinds of successions, we looked at primary, secondary, cyclical successions, we looked at different serial stages, we defined a primary community, looked at its characteristics, we defined a climax community, looked at its characteristics, we looked at different kinds of climaxes that can come up and so on. So, a study of succession is extremely important in the case of community ecology, because this is a process by which a community changes from one stage to another. So, that is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.